Good afternoon, I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am so pleased to welcome you to this final talk in our 2018 Tuesday with a Scholar series. Um, we are so delighted to welcome Professor Richard Painter from the University of Minnesota for a return appearance. Many of you may remember he was here last year. This appearance is made possible by two organizations that I want to single out. The first one is the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, our great partner in the Tuesday with a Scholar series. The second sponsor is, the, is Minnesota's uh, Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, who is the financial underwriter of this series and makes everything possible. So I know that you have come to listen to Professor Painter, not me, uh, and so I'm delighted to turn over the podium to Professor Richard Painter, who will tell us everything about ethics and the uh, recently concluded election. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I am thrilled to be back here. Uh, it's been about a year. A lot has happened in this past year. Uh, I, we've had a very interesting presidency, continue to, um, and uh, the bulk of my comments uh, will focus on the problems we have had and continue to have in the executive branch of the United States government under President Trump and the possibility that the United States House of Representatives, now that it has changed as of January over to control of the Democrats, the possibility that the United States House of Representatives might play a constructive role in investigating what has been going on uh, and perhaps even doing something about it. Um, we have many of the, continue to have many of the problems that we had all along uh, with respect to President Trump. Uh, the uh, financial relationships the president has with foreign governments and foreign nationals have yet not, not yet been disclosed. Bob Mueller probably knows a lot more about those than the rest of us do. He may or may not summarize some of his findings about financial relationships with Russia in particular uh, in his report um, uh, when he concludes his investigation. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the intent of the founders when they framed the Constitution of the United States uh, with respect to foreign governments and financial relationships with foreign governments was quite clear. The founders did not want any person holding a position of trust with the United States government to receive any profits or benefits from foreign governments. That's specifically what the Constitution says in the so-called Emoluments Clause. If you hold a position of trust with the United States government, you may not receive a present or an emolument from a foreign government. The word emolument, defined in Dr. Johnson's dictionary, 1755, is a profit or advantage or benefit. It's quite clear that if you are holding a position of trust with the United States government, you cannot be doing business deals with foreign governments at the same time. Why? Because the founders knew that the great powers of Europe uh, with their very heavily concentrated wealth in the hands of the crown in Great Britain and France and Austria, Hungary and Russia, that those countries would seek to buy through money that which they could not obtain through force of arms, which was to dominate the United States, to recolonize the United States. The Emoluments Clause is not an obscure provision of the Constitution. Perhaps it has been until recently because we didn't have to worry about corruption of United States government officials by foreign governments. But it is a critically important provision of the United States Constitution. In the past two years, I have been involved with three lawsuits against President Trump under the Emoluments Clause. One bought by, brought by Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, uh, an organization that I'm on the board of directors of, 
And we brought suit in the Southern District of New York uh, is saying that the president should be enjoined from receiving any profits and benefits from his dealings with foreign governments. Uh, the uh, federal district judge in New York believed we did not have standing to bring that suit, dismissed it. We went to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and that is pending. But two similar complaints, modeled on ours, and I was involved in these suits as well, uh, were filed by other plaintiffs who have been held by the federal courts to have standing. One of those lawsuits was brought by the Attorney General of the State of Maryland and the Attorney General of the State uh, of the uh, District of Columbia. Uh, and they have standing because some of the Trump businesses, including the Trump Hotel, compete with businesses in Maryland and the District of Columbia. The Federal District Court in Maryland gave a green light to that lawsuit uh, to proceed. And then a number of months ago, in a, an opinion of the court, specifically held that our interpretation of the emoluments clause and the word emolument, the dictionary definition, profit and advantage, that our interpretation was a correct one uh, and that the president um, and no one else were working in a position of trust with the United States government may receive profits and benefits from dealings with foreign governments. That case will now proceed to discovery where the court can figure out what profits and benefits this president has been receiving from our foreign governments, at least with respect to the Trump Hotel in Washington, if not the rest of his business. We all know about the foreign governments that have been booking ballrooms and hotel rooms and running up the tab at the Trump Hotel to, uh, to appeal to our president, including, I believe, the Saudis and various other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and this is a matter of serious concern and the court will be looking into that. Then the third lawsuit was brought by a number of Democrats, the United States House and Senate, led by Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut, uh, once again claiming standing because the Constitution provides that you may receive these emoluments, these profits and benefits from dealings with foreign governments if you have the consent of Congress. President Trump never got the consent of Congress, why not? Well, even the Republicans in Congress did not want to give him a free pass to deal with any foreign governments he so chose, unless, of course, they get to see the tax returns. He doesn't want to share those tax returns. That may be changing soon. Um, but bottom line is he never went to Congress for permission, so the Senate and the House Democrats filed suit, a whole bunch of them, and said, hey, he's supposed to come to us for permission. He didn't. And that suit is pending in the federal district court in the District of Columbia and would cover all of President Trump's businesses. Now, what I want to emphasize is not just about hotels and hotel rooms and ballrooms and restaurant tabs uh, with the Saudis or whoever else. It's about the financing of the Trump business empire. Where is he getting his money? I don't know. All I know is I practiced law in New York City in the late 80s and early 1990s before I went into law teaching, and I saw millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of Trump debt go down the tubes. $900 million worth of casino bonds in Atlantic City, not paid in default. And once you don't pay back bankers, at least in New York, they don't loan you more money. I think that's common with bankers around the United States. And the European bankers have cut them off as well. So the question is, where has Donald Trump been borrowing money since the 1990s? And there are all different theories about that, have been for 20 years. Well, you shouldn't have to speculate about this when it involves the President of the United States. We should know who the President of the United States has a financial dependency relationship on. He's, we know he's not getting his money from Citibank. He's not getting it from U.S. Bank. Well, where is he getting the money? We know he's getting some money from Deutsche Bank. We just don't know whether Deutsche Bank's taking the risk and whether they're willing to loan money and take risks that none of the U.S. banks will take or whether somebody walked into a branch office, it's, let's just say hypothetically in Moscow, and put down a couple of hundred million dollars and said, here, you can hold it on deposit. We want to guarantee a guarantee a loan in New York. We don't know. Well, in my view, it's the job of the United States Congress to find out 
we shouldn't have had to go to court to file these lawsuits. We shouldn't have to ask a judge to issue a subpoena, give us discovery from the Trump Organization to find out where the president's borrowing the money. Indeed, the federal district judge in New York who dismissed the crew lawsuit, the organization I am on the board of directors of, said, well, Congress should be the one enforcing the emoluments clause of the Constitution. We, the courts, really shouldn't have anything to do with it. Now, I don't agree with the Judge Daniels when he said we, the courts, shouldn't have anything to do with it. I certainly agree with the notion that Congress has some responsibility as well. And Judge Daniels proceeded to say, well, Congress is not a potted plant. <laughs> well, they've been acting like a potted plant. <laughs> so last Tuesday, we just took that pot. We just sort of shook that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I lost my congressman. <laughs> Jason Lewis, I'm from, I'm from Mendota Heights. He's such a nice guy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Angie Craig has been looking for a, uh, trying to look for a job for him for two years now, so maybe she has some ideas there. Um, and uh, they lost Eric Paulson over there in the third, too. So, you know, uh, people are getting tired of Congress wants to sit around and do nothing. And uh, the Congress has a responsibility uh, of oversight with respect to the executive branch of the United States government, including the President of the United States. And uh, there are a lot else that's been going on with this administration. Uh, and there's a lot that Congress may very well want to investigate. Some of it involves policy differences with this administration or areas where there's a strong feeling that the um, administration is acting outside its constitutional powers. For example, what's been going on on our southern border and a number of other areas. But we cannot ignore. We ignore at the risk of our national security uh, what has been going on with respect to foreign governments. The founders anticipated this problem of financial dependencies on foreign governments and is the obligation of Congress to find out what's going on. And that may very well mean subpoenaing not just the tax returns of the Trump Organization, but getting all the financial records and finding out where they're getting the money uh, and who the various joint venture partnerships uh, are with. Uh, we cannot have a president who is dealing with foreign dictators uh, as a matter of policy and as a matter of the Constitution. So that's, that's a tough priority for the United States House of Representatives. And we can see if the Senate wants to follow suit as well. They've got some difficulties over there. Uh, but um, uh, when I was a kid back in 1973, I was 12 years old, I remember watching the hearings of the United States House and Senate Judiciary Committee looking into what was going on with Richard Nixon. Uh, and uh, granted, both houses were controlled by Democrats, so maybe they had a little more incentive to investigate. But I still remember the Republicans, at least some of them, were asking some reasonably good questions. Uh, and I grew up in central Illinois, and many of us were Republicans, so I'm happy to see some Republicans who actually stepped into the plates, like Senator Baker, who asked, when did the, what did the president know, when did he know it? Uh, and, uh, you know... It, there was a rule of law in place back then. We were not going to tolerate certain things from a president with respect to obstruction of justice or breaking and entering into uh, the Watergate uh, complex. Well, here we are again. And instead of a, just a, you know, a really sloppy burglary job at the Watergate, uh, you know, we've got a very professional computer hacking job that's been done by the Russians as if the Watergate job had been done by the KGB. And Nixon, he says, I'm not a crook. Okay, well, he was a crook, but at least he was our crook. <laughs> he wasn't their crook. And so, you know, it's as if we got Nixon and, uh, 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 you know, and, and all the various uh, Russian spy rings and, and the Alger his controversy and all that rolled into one. And that Congress is just sitting there, yeah, like a pot of plant. Uh, and this is critically important our national security to find out what's going on. The financial relationships, top priority. Every time Bob Mueller tries to go near the financial ties that Donald Trump has with anybody, anywhere, people start talking about firing Bob Mueller. Now we've got this new guy, Whitaker, whose own appointment is constitutionally questionable. Well, not just questionable, it's invalid. 
uh, who now wants to start telling Robert Mueller what to do. Well, you try to tell Robert Mueller what to do and see what happens. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work that way. Uh, he's going to tell Robert Mueller, don't go anywhere near the Trump finances. First, I think Robert Mueller probably already has a lot of information about the Trump finances. The New York Attorney General is in on this, too, and has a lot of that information. And I don't think that uh, Matthew Whitaker is going to be stopping him. And then furthermore, we're going to have the United States House Judiciary Committee swing into high gear in, uh, in January. Um, and so we, we are in a lot better position than we were a year ago when I last spoke here. But we shouldn't have had to wait this long. And we need to urge Congress to make this a top priority. Looking into what's going on with respect to Russia and other foreign governments and their relationship with our president, with the Kushner family, and with others who are high up in this administration. And I'm going to throw Wilbur Ross in there as well. He owns a couple of shipping companies that are doing business with Russian oligarchs. Um, so what else is going on? <laughs> a lot. We're going to have the continued attempts to derail the Mueller investigation. And the firing of Jeff Sessions, that was very predictable that, that was going to happen the day after Election Day. He was just biding his time. Uh, and he, of course, would like to get rid of Bob Robert Mueller. The question is, who's willing to do that? And I'm sure that people were asked what they're willing to do with respect to Bob Mueller, and people made it clear that they didn't want to go to jail. <laughs> Noel Francisco, who is the number three, the Solicitor General, I don't think he wants to tangle with Bob Mueller. So they found this uh, fellow, Matthew Whitaker, who was the Chief of Staff for the Attorney General, uh, you know, it's never good to have a situation where you, you're, you're the boss, but your chief of staff is schmoozing your boss about firing you. So I feel bad for Jeff Sessions a little bit. Um, so they found Matthew Whitaker. Now, the problem with this appointment is that Whitaker has never been confirmed by the Senate for anything. It's a little hard to get confirmed when you're on the board of advisors or whatever a company that's under FBI investigation. And you're on the record of saying such things as, well, judges should be Christians. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian churchgoer my, myself, but uh, I think uh, we live in a, a country here where, um, you know, you could be a judge if you're a, a, a Jewish or a Muslim or an agnostic. Uh, yeah, read the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and that clause which says there shouldn't be no religious test for public office. Uh, and Whitaker doesn't know what he's talking about. He's running for Senate. He's trying to appeal to the religious right down in uh, uh, Iowa. But, you know, this guy couldn't get confirmed for anything. Well, we would assume, but you never know. The Senate once in a while, whatever. But they didn't put him up for confirmation for anything. And now he's going to be the Attorney General of the United States. Well, no, the Vacancies Act, it's quite clear. The, if you have a resignation, you have someone gets fired like the Attorney General, the president should be going on down the line and filling that position with the deputy, Rod Rosenstein. He certainly doesn't want to do that. And then no Francisco, but Francisco, the Solicitor General, apparently doesn't want to tangle with Mueller. But that's what the Vacancies Act provides. So I think this is a serious question about whether there's a valid appointment uh, of Mr. Whitaker. So that's another thing that's going to be on the, on the, on the to-do list for the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Committee. Yes, they've got work to do. Uh, because the attempt to take over and politicize the Justice Department even more than it already is politicized is, is a very, very scary one. And this also could be a repeat of what Richard Nixon did. Richard Nixon wanted to get rid of the special prosecutor, Archie Cox. He at least went through the proper line of succession. He said, well, Attorney General uh, uh, Elliot Richardson, you've got to fire Archie Cox. Of course, Elliot Richardson wasn't going to fire Archie Cox. He wasn't going to get in that. So he says, no. He goes to Bill Ruckel's house, will you fire Archie Cox? Ruckel's house says no. He gets down to Bob Bork, who's the Solicitor General. Bob Bork, do you want to fire you know, Archie Cox? Yeah, sure. Will I get on the Supreme Court someday? Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, didn't exactly work. But uh, at least Nixon went on down the line of succession in Saturday Night Massacre. He didn't go get the Attorney General's Chief of Staff to do it. You know, find some guy who looks like he's a bouncer for a Russian bar or something. I mean, give me a break. This is pathetic. Uh, so, uh, you know, what is at stake here is the rule of law. 
in this country. We have the Constitution. We have procedures set forth in the Vacancies Act. And the president has to be expected to follow the Constitution and the statutes of the United States. This is not a dictatorship. We do not have autocratic rule. It is the most powerful office in the, in the world, president of the United States. But that doesn't mean there aren't some rules. And we're going to expect this president to follow those rules if he wants to stick around. All right. Well, now I've gone on enough about President Trump. How about the rest of them? Okay, financial conflicts of interest. There's a statute, 18 United States Code 208, which criminalizes financial conflicts of interest for executive branch officials. Anybody who is serving in the executive branch of the United States government who participates in a particular government matter that has a direct and predictable effect on their financial interest or that of their spouse commits a crime under 18 United States Code 208, unless they have received a specific waiver of that conflict of interest from the person who appointed them. For a cabinet member, that would be a waiver from the President of the United States. So it is a crime to be at the Department of Health and Human Services and make decisions about drug company prices if you own drug company stock, medical devices if you own medical device company stock, or to be over at the Department of Energy and make decisions about oil drilling if you own oil company stock. That would be a crime. And that is why I, when I was the chief um, White House ethics lawyer for President George W. Bush, I'd explain to Hank Paulson, the chairman of the board of Goldman Sachs and CEO, if you want to be Treasury Secretary, you can't own Goldman Sachs stock. Pretty basic. There's a lot you could do as Treasury Secretary that could affect the value of Goldman Sachs stock. For example, bailing out Wall Street. Yeah. I didn't know we were going to get massive bailouts, although I think that Hank Paulson was brought in because people smelled there was trouble on the horizon. But I distinctly remember in 2006 having that conversation with Hank Paulson, and he understood he'd have to sell the Goldman Sachs stock, all $600 billion worth of it. I felt really bad for him. I'd never been in a position of having to sell $600 million worth of stock. Uh, but I, but uh, I, I talked to his lawyers, and we worked out that he actually wouldn't have to pay a capital gains tax on that sale because the ethics lawyer told him he had to sell it. That's a pretty nifty provision in the tax code there. Say to him, a good 50 or 60 million. Man, okay, we're going to sell the stock. And I could tell him, well, you know, the president of the United States, he doesn't, you know, he plays by the same rules. He's avoided conflicts of interest. And whatever you might think of President Bush, he did not have personal financial conflicts of interest. Now, Vice President Cheney was a whole other story, but he wouldn't, they wouldn't let me anywhere near anything to do with Vice President Cheney. <laughs> their, their view was the Vice President could tell the President what to do in things like Iraq, but if I tried to talk about Vice President Cheney's finances, <laughs> I was out of my lane. Uh, but anyway, he had a little interesting situation with Halliburton, which you know, brought up some questions there. Um, what's the problem? The problem is 18 United States Code 208 does not apply to the President and the Vice President. So you depend on voluntary compliance, which we have always had in the past with perhaps that question mark next to Vice President Cheney with respect to some Halliburton options. But still, even there, he didn't get that much personal financial benefit from them. He created some sort of weird trust where it went to charity. I didn't like the smell of it, but it, it, uh, he wasn't directly conflicted. Well, Donald Trump reminded us right before he took office. Gee, I didn't know this. The president can't have a conflict of interest. Whoa, wait a minute. That's not the point. The point is that this criminal statute, 18 United States Code 208, does not apply to the president and the vice president. Congress has chosen not to criminalize that conflict of interest for the president and the vice president for a number of different reasons. One of the reasons being that Congress also didn't want to criminalize such a conflict of interest for members of Congress. And they also are allowed to have these conflicts of interest. And it's up to us, the voters, to vote them out. That's the theory. But with respect to these presidents and vice presidents and the overwhelming majority of senators and members of the United States House of Representatives, with a few exceptions of insider trading politicians in New York, we'll talk about those guys in a minute, uh, members of the House, Senate, and certainly presidents and vice presidents have avoided personal financial conflicts of interest, at least about 95% of them have. 
Uh, it is a serious problem of uh, what we have going on. But the people in the executive branch who are bound by the criminal conflict of interest statute are playing fast and loose with the facts and the law. And I believe a number of them have crossed the line, or at least there's significant evidence that they've crossed the line. How can Wilbur Ross be, be Commerce Secretary and own a shipping company that's doing business with uh, Russian oligarchs? Uh, shipping is commerce, the last I checked. <laughs> so I think there's a serious problem. That, for me, would be a no-brainer. If you want to be the Commerce Secretary, you don't own the shipping company. You sell the shipping company. But he didn't feel like selling the shipping company. Why not? What's happening here is when the President of the United States wants to hold on to his financial conflicts of interest and says, well, the statute doesn't apply to me, so I'm special, everybody else who is bound by the statute is going to push it, uh, the envelope as much as they can to hold on to what they want because they don't want to have to sell off their financial conflicts of interest because the whole mantra is, gee, it would be an impediment to going into public service if people had to sell their business interests. And if that argument is made by the president, it can be made by the Commerce Secretary. But the key difference is that the Commerce Secretary is subject to the statute. The prosecutions under this statute should be by the Department of Justice, now run by supposedly Mr. Whitaker. Hmm. <laughs> Well, we'll see at the Public Integrity Division, which is staffed mostly with career attorneys, track some of these people down and starts asking some questions. But who can break things open with respect to financial conflicts of interest, at least with respect to investigations? The United States Congress. And this is where the United States House Oversight Committee comes in. So we have not just the Judiciary Committee that needs to get work, but the Oversight Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives. Their job is to oversee what's going on in the executive branch and to investigate when there is evidence of serious wrongdoing. Now, they spent over two years investigating the email of the Secretary of State, not the then current Secretary of State, John Kerry, because nobody cared about the current Secretary of State, John Kerry, at the time, because he'd already run for president and lost. They all went to do nothing but investigate Hillary Clinton's email. So this committee spent an enormous amount of time investigating Hillary Clinton's email server and pressuring the FBI to investigate, demanding periodic updates from the FBI, preferably one week before the election, about Hillary Clinton's email. They didn't find diddly squat in the email of Secretary Clinton. Well, now they got some real work to do, and they haven't been doing it. So the question is whether the Democrats are going to use their power uh, it, when they control this committee, to look at where the real financial conf conflicts of interest are likely to be, uh, real violations of the criminal conflict of interest statute, 18 United States Code 208. Now, I have said, in order to take the high road on this, I think the members of the United States House and Senate need to themselves insist that their colleagues sell out financial, divest themselves of financial conflicts of interest. I'm sick and tired of hearing about the congressman from upstate New York who is under indictment for insider trading in drug company stocks while he's working on health care legislation that apparently is reelected. It's like, what is it? You know, the people are so partisan in upstate New York, they're willing to elect someone who has been indicted for insider trading because they can't stand a Democrat. And, uh, you know, and then there's several others, and we've had senators who have got large holdings in the health care industry, a handful. And it's critically important that all of those people divest <laughs> financial conflicts of interest in the House and Senate who have them, and that the other members pressure their colleagues to do the same. Some of them are Republicans, a lot of them are Republicans, some of them are Democrats. Critically important to do that to take the high road on this issue, because we're going to have to hold this administration accountable for financial conflicts of interest. Well, what else has been going on in ethics, or lack thereof? Partisan political activity, use of public office for partisan political activity. The advice we always gave President Bush with respect to Air Force One is he could take Air Force One and go on a campaign treat, uh, trip, but you don't give the speech right in front of Air Force One. It's not a prop for campaign rally. 
You get off the plane. Yes, the president can walk. All right. And he went to a place where he get the speech in front of a flag or whatever he wants to use, but not in front of the plane. That's the way it was always been done. Now, I know they could have one or two shots with President Obama. They could have used a wide-angle lens and get the plane in there or something. And say, oh, he did it too. No nonsense. So you got Trump saying they're right in front of the plane, giving the speech for their, as commander-in-chief, and it's a political speech. Now, the Hatch Act doesn't apply to the president, so you can't fire him for this. Well, actually, there's another provision in the Constitution that provides that perhaps Congress could fire him. Impeachment clause. And you could tank this on. But the Hatch Act doesn't apply to the president, so he may think he can get away with it. But his use of public office for private gain is using the position as commander-in-chief to promote political candidates. And we've had other Hatch Act violations which are very clear by White House staff. I mean, Kellyanne Conway standing on the White House lawn, and she was showing for, um, well, she's going after Senator Doug Jones. Of, uh, in, uh, she's trying to get that guy elected, Roy Moore, the guy with the cowboy hat and the, and the, the, the bell of the Bible he re doesn't read and the horse. Uh, and she's trying to get Roy Moore elected down there in Alabama, so she's standing on the White House lawn and trashing Doug Jones in an official interview. So you can't do that. So I went on the television and said, look, you know, Kellyanne Conway wants to support a, you know, some child molester. I don't care who she wants to support the United States Senate. Doing your own lawn and your own time. Don't use your official White House title. But you can't stand on the White House lawn and endorse anybody or attack their opponent. You just can't do it under the Hatch Act. And, you know, the Office of Special Counsel says it's a violation of the Hatch Act, and what did the White House say? Nah, they're wrong. <laughs> oh, where's the legal analysis there? Mm, none, they're wrong. And then she did it again. I mean, Kellyanne just doesn't stop. Even her own husband's getting tired of her. <laughs> now, by the way, my, my law school classmate, George T. Conway, great guy, he went to law school with me. The arch conservative, well, more conservative than I am, and... I thought myself being middle of the road, moderate, you know, whatever. But uh, uh, George, really conservative and support a lot of Republicans and his partner, Wachtell Lipton, in New York. Uh, but, you know, he's got he's got to be in his mind going after Trump. He's sick and tired of this guy. So look at his Twitter feed, G.T. Conway the Third. It's great. Uh, and he's probably tweeting from the couch. Uh, you know, I don't know uh, what the arranged sleeping arrangements are there. But he's... Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's a good guy, a smart guy. Uh, and, you know, that, and that shows that someone could be an arch conservative and understand what the rule of law is all about. This shouldn't be political. This shouldn't be ideological. Uh, this is about the rule of law. And the reason to attack Republicans in Congress is they're not doing their job. It's not because they're Republicans. It's because if they're not doing their job, and the reason they're not doing their job is partisan loyalty. Loyalty to, par to party before country, they should be out of there. Because I understand people who want to be loyal to a party. I myself am now political independent. I understand that desire for some people, particularly holding elected office, to be loyal to a political party. But you cannot allow your loyalty to a political party to surpass your loyalty to the United States of America. And these people in the United States House and Senate haven't been doing their job. Uh, and they, uh, people will look at someone like George Conway, who's a very conservative lawyer, who is willing to recognize the problems we've got in this administration. Um, so we got issues to deal with. Now, in uh, close, we went through an interesting situation with uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Oh boy. Um, and uh, the confirmation process. And this is an area where I think the Democrats uh, should have. One of the problems with it is keeping the message focused on the big picture of what's been going on. And the big picture, I mean, the, the assault allegations, how that was handled, would fit into a bigger picture. But the bigger picture is not the, pic the discussion of sexual assault allegations on the Anita Hill going back. That, that's what the media wanted to spend a lot of time on. And I don't think that really helped the Democrats, at least in the Senate races. The big picture is an attempt to pack the Supreme Court with right-wing ideologues. 
and has been going on for a long time, and we know that both sides play the Supreme Court game in the game with respect to the lower courts. But in the past several years, we have had some extreme departures from the normal rules. And go back two years ago, or in 2016, when President Obama, a little over two years ago, nominated Merrick Garland to the United States Supreme Court to replace Justice Scalia, who had passed away. We have always had a hearing for a Supreme Court nominee, always. And yet Mitch McConnell said, no, we're not going to even have a hearing for Merrick Garland. It's not that we're going to vote no. We won't even have a hearing. We won't talk to the guy. Why? Because he's a very nice and reasonable guy, and voting against him would have been bad in the elections. No, he didn't say that. He said, we just aren't going to have a hearing. No go. So for the first time ever, they refused to have a hearing for a nominee to the United States Supreme Court. Extreme departure from the ordinary procedures. Do they have the right to do that? Under the Constitution, do they have to have a hearing? Does the Constitution say they have to have a hearing? Well, you could argue they don't have to have a hearing. In other words, advice and consent means, nope, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to give any advice. Our advice is, nope, nope, we won't do it. But are they carrying out their constitutional responsibilities? Absolutely not. So that was an extreme departure from the ordinary process for confirmation hearings. And I went and gave a speech down in Iowa, another one in Pennsylvania, trying to light a fire to both Chuck Grassley and uh, Pat Toomey. Didn't work. Uh, and of course, then the Republicans were awarded for that in the 2016 elections, or thought they were. So then the next step is to say, we are now going to confirm justices by the narrowest margins, just one vote, as opposed to reaching a consensus. So you go back and you look at previous nominations, most all of them have been not necessarily by a supermajority, but not by only one or two votes. And the Republicans in the Senate said, new rules here. Now, I know the Democrats, for the lower court justices, had moved toward the 51-vote rule three years earlier. But that was used as the excuse now for the Supreme Court of the United States to put someone on there by 51 votes. Then, who gets nominated? We had Gorsuch, and then we had Kavanaugh. My first, first concern about Judge Kavanaugh, who I worked with in the White House, he was the uh, chief, um, the um, staff secretary. My concern about him, and still my overriding concern about him, is partisanship. And when you go look back at his involvement with Ken Starr and going after Bill Clinton over the whole Lewinsky thing, and then what does he do? He goes into the Bush administration, after eight years in the Bush administration, completely changes his view and writes an article in the Minnesota Law Review saying that the president should not be investigated, that that would interfere with the president's performing his official duties. Now, I understand that the situation like the Clinton investigation, yeah, I, I think that uh, that type of litigation and that thing are way out of control. There's got to be a sense of proportion. You know, it's one thing of the president messing around with a White House intern and lying about it, yes, under oath. And another thing of the president, let's say he's in bed, just theoretically, let's just say the president's in bed with the Russians. And he's lying about it. Yeah. You're going to tell me we can't investigate? And so what you see is Brett Kavanaugh is completely changing his view about executive power. That is not a good situation when you have this president because we need a court that is going to check his power. Remember when Archie Cox wanted those tapes from Richard Nixon? Archie Cox had to go to the United States Supreme Court and got the Supreme Court to tell Richard Nixon to hand over the tapes. What's going to happen if Bob Mueller has to go to the United States Supreme Court and get evidence from the White House? Now you start to see exactly why Donald Trump would choose Brett Kavanaugh. Because it's right there in writing that, oh, you got to have executive power. No, nope, you can't investigate the president. Well, I like that. There were some questions about that in the hearing, but not enough. 
There's an organization he belonged to called the Eureka Club. Almost no questions about it. Eureka Club apparently was a gathering of Federalist Society types, conservative lawyers who can you know, meet and talk about all sorts, and that's okay, but if he was going and doing that as a judge, we've got some serious issues. He's been a judge for a number of years. Very few questions about that. So the, the, my concern about what's, what's going on with the Supreme Court is we need to keep our eye on the big picture, which is the increased politicization of the court. Uh, and the, it's, it's the attempt to obviously change the, poor, the court's views on the abortion question and the Roe versus Wade, which is 45-year-old case law, and to turn that around, but also now the executive power issue. And uh, this is not healthy for a democracy, what's going on. And the question is, what's the next step? Are the Democrats just going to sit down and keep taking it? Or are they going to say, okay, well, Mitch McConnell, you want to read the Constitution, say it says you don't have to have a hearing from Merrick Garland. Well, we can read the Constitution, too. Well, Franklin Roosevelt read the Constitution back in 1937. Yep, Supreme Court was jerking him around big time. They just kept striking down his New Deal legislation. You know, the nine old men or whatever. He looked, where's that number nine? Hmm, I can't find it. So they said, well, we're going to add a few justices. Then they changed their mind. We had Chief Justice Roberts here at the University of Minnesota the other day, and I just, I just in question with the faculty, he met with the faculty, I just brought out the Judicial Procedures Reform Act of 1937. He started getting very nervous. That was the point. You know, they got to realize that, you know, if they push it, the, Congre the, the Constitution does have some checks and balances in there. And if people want to play literally by the rules the way Mitch McConnell does, well, okay, you can play by the way FDR did. And by the way, FDR never had to do that because Justice Owen Roberts changed his vote, stopped messing around with the president. Well, Chief Justice John Roberts may have seen the same, things the same way. They, they, this court needs to cool it with respect to the most partisan 5-4 decisions. And I'm going to end talking about what I think is the worst decision in the 20th century and the 20, well, 20th and 21st century. The past two centuries, the worst decision of this court, absolute worst, Citizens United. And then there are a handful of other ones, too. And, you know, this shouldn't be a partisan political issue. Barry Goldwater said, Back in, night, in his book on the conscience of a conservative, back in 64 or whenever, when he ran in 64, but he wrote in this book, he said that corporate money and union money doesn't belong in politics. Contributions should be from individuals. And the Supreme Court first started striking down campaign finance rules in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo back in the early 1980s, where they struck down the limits on campaign spending and said you can't limit campaign spending. That was Buckley versus Vallejo. Barry Goldwater said that was wrong. The Supreme Court had no business doing that, and he was right. So this shouldn't be a partisan issue. Republicans and Democrats, when you do polling on this issue around the United States, Republicans, Democrats, independents are uniformly fed up with our campaign finance system and the fact that we can't limit campaign spending. I experienced this firsthand. I ran a Senate. I decided to jump in a primary in the Democratic uh, Farmer Labor Party. Uh, you can jump in a primary in this state. You don't have to be a, we don't register in parties. Um, and uh, I jumped in their uh, primary, but one of the interesting things I found was I, I raised $300,000 for a Senate race. If, if $300,000 isn't enough money uh, to run through a primary, what kind of country do we live in? But I got outspent 15 to 1. Uh, you know, it, it's just the enormous amount of money. So if that's the system we've got, I don't know if I want the job. Because to defend the position, you've got to raise more cash. And then who are you dependent on? The people who give you the cash. This system is messed up. And, you know, Congress occasionally tries to fix it with campaign finance regulation. We had one batch of regulation after Watergate, but then the court started striking that down in Buckley versus Vallejo struck down the limits on campaign spending. And then we had the McCain-Feingold bill that was sponsored by John McCain, Republican, another Republican of Arizona. So now we've got two presidential nominees, Goldwater and McCain, both senators from Arizona, Republicans support campaign finance reform. And what does this court do? They strike it down and say it's united. This has got to stop. And this is out of control judicial activism. 
And this is exactly the kind of thing that would justify thinking about what FDR did back in 1937 when the Supreme Court decided they're going to strike down democratically elected uh, the, the legislation passed by democratically elected representatives to, at that time to try to salvage our uh, economy. Uh, this is not a good situation. The Supreme Court needs to back off uh, on campaign finance. We don't fix this system. We're in big trouble. It's not just about American money. It's about foreign money. Because uh, more and more corporations in the United States are controlled by foreign nationals, have joint ventures with foreign nationals. We are in a global economy. I don't have this antipathy to globalization that Donald Trump and some on the extreme left do, but it needs to be regulated. There need to be rules in a global economy. And what we're going to have, if we keep our current campaign finance system, is where the people who make the rules for the United States of America are chosen by oligarchs all over the world, be they Russian, be they Saudi, from the Philippines, China, wherever. And if we want to go back to being a colony, being colonized by other powers, where we were before 1776, and we want to go in reverse, well, then let's just keep our campaign finance system. But don't come to me talking about the Tea Party, because that's exactly the opposite of what the real Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party, was all about. I want to take some questions, have some discussion here. And, and we are going to have questions, but let me bring the mic around so that all the audience hears all the questions, and so does the television audience. I think this gentleman had his hand up. This might be kind of a long question, but basically, I, I keep on the news and in your speech and everything, I keep hearing about they can't do that, they can't do this, this departure from the norm, all this stuff about government officials, elected officials, and things that they can't do that they are doing. Now, we don't trust our corporations to police themselves. I'm beginning if there shouldn't be some external agency that polices the government. Yeah. <laughs> well, what the framers had in mind, and it works sometimes, it doesn't yeah. at other times, is the separate branches of government. The legislative branch, the executive branch, and the courts. And this is why it is so dangerous to have judges, particularly Supreme Court justices, are chosen because of their deference to presidential power. And I think that theme should have been given a lot more emphasis in the Kavanaugh hearing. You've got to have judges who are willing to stand up to the president. Second, um, when you have a president like Donald Trump having the both houses of Congress controlled by his political party is a very dangerous situation. We made it through these two years. Let's try to make it to January. But the way the founders anticipated, I think is part of what's happened here, is that we're gonna have one of the houses of Congress is gonna switch over to the Democrats. So they are gonna have the power to investigate. And they choose to investigate the right things. They may or may not be able to impeach and remove the president because you need two thirds of the Senate to remove the president and the Republicans won't do that, which I think any rational Republican should want to do, which mm -hmm. is to get him out of there. Uh, but we certainly are going to have a lot more ability as a country to have checks and balances in place with the United States House of Representatives changing hands. But that's why I want to emphasize they need to pick the right things to investigate, not just go trying to appeal to their political base on issues, but focus on these big picture things matters of concern to every American, not to particular constituents. And second, make sure their own house is in order. Why members of the United States House and Senate of both parties should be under extreme pressure. I think there should be a law prohibiting them from having financial conflicts of interest. That statute that I mentioned should be amended to prohibit financial conflicts of interest of the members of the House, the Senate, and the President, Vice President, and then send that over to him and let him veto it. You got it. Actually, ooh, thank you for being here. I have actually two, um, I'll be quick. One is, I thought I heard there are ethics complaints against Kavanaugh that were in the DC court and they've moved it to Colorado. And the other is, are the taxpayers, or were they paying anything for all of Trump's campaigning trips? Uh, well, let's start with the, uh, the second one. And the answer is yes, just like the taxpayers pay for him to go to Mar-a-Lago on a regular basis. 
Now, we've had some of this with previous presidents, although there's supposed to be a split when Air Force One is used uh, for political travel. The problem is that uh, a Republican committee only has to reimburse the government for the cost of, I think, private jet tickets, not for the cost of actually flying that great big plane wherever. Um, and perhaps we ought to revisit that. Uh, but he does it much more than other presidents, and then he throws his personal travel in as well because of his so-called winter White House that he's got going on down there in Mar-a-Lago. Um, so there's been definitely an abuse of the taxpayer-funded um, uh, uh, trips. Uh, Kavanaugh, I'm sure there's some uh, complaints. I, I think that this juncture, um, uh, that the, the, the most productive approach in the Supreme Court is to think about future seats and also sending the message that if this court starts to make dramatic decisions either in this campaign finance area or, you know, quite frankly, if they start changing well-established case law. And, you know, I think about the, you know, the, the Roe versus Way, that type of thing. Um, you know, it looks so political. I think this court's got to understand that the Democrats may have to take seriously this, you know, what FDR did of adding some justices. I think that, you know, the, impeaching a justice, removing a justice of the court, uh, for anything other than clear evidence of a felony, I think is a very dangerous road to go. I would not go there. Uh, and I think that is not time that should be, I, I don't think that's going to help the Democrats because the independence of judiciary is critical. We may not like him, although you look at the way he votes, it may be not different than Justice Alito and so forth. The problem is the packing of the court. That's the core issue that we're dealing with. The decisions of that court, they're going to affect us. And are we at a, have we reached a point of constitutional crisis with this court as FDR did in 1937? A future Democratic president may have to deal with that. And the Democrats will probably control both houses of Congress, you know, three or so years down the road and may have the White House. But I think they go the route of trying to impeach and remove a justice of the court. Uh, that is going to be a very dangerous road unless there is extremely strong evidence. This gentleman, Hi, I have two questions. One is when should um, a candidate for office or an attorney general recuse himself from, from an issue? And then the other is should the Democrats bother to uh, pursue the impeachment process at all given the current state of the Senate? Well, when should Attorney General recuse himself? One situation which a, an acting Attorney General should uh, recuse himself from everything is if he's not validly appointed by the President, <laughs> because the President didn't follow the procedure set forth in the Vacancies Act. For more information on that, do see the Twitter feed of G.T. Conway III <laughs> tweeting from his couch. <laughs> um, now, I think Whitaker has some additional issues, and he's already opined on the Mueller investigation, writing in CNN op-ed saying that Mueller shouldn't go anywhere near the Trump finances. I mean, what a great way to kiss up to Donald Trump. He's <laughs> obviously kissing up for the job, and, you know, because we know that that's what Trump is sensitive about. So he's been mouthing off about this investigation. Now he wants to take it over. Uh, it's so obvious that what he's being pressured to do is to try and curtail Mueller. Now, whether he has an ethical obligation to accuse himself like Sessions, it's a harder call because he was not himself involved as high up in the Trump campaign. I don't know what he did for Donald Trump, but he was, did not have that problem that Sessions had. And Sessions was in, in completely in with the campaign, sitting on meetings where talking about the Russians, and then he goes in front of the United States Senate and forgets about all the Russians he knew. And when he lies when he's asked questions by Al Franken. That's the only reason he recused, by the way, Sessions, was because Al Franken caught him in a lie. And it, rather than resign, he recused. Uh, I, I don't think you have a strong case for recusal here on those grounds. The grounds, I think, for recusal, one, he's not validly appointed. And second, anybody who gets involved in trying to interfere with Robert Mueller is risking themselves getting charged with obstruction of justice. So there's a serious question of whether he wants to end up doing jail time. He's got to think seriously about what he's willing to do for Donald Trump. We've already fired the FBI director to try and stop the Russian investigation. Hmm. Do you really want to mess with Bob Mueller? I don't. We've got a question over here. 
Another question from the floor. <laughs> you mentioned constitutional crisis. What's your definition of that, and are we approaching one or more than one? Well, it's not a term defined in the Constitution, but I think when you have a serious clash between you know, two or more branches of government, uh, and then each branch has to look at what the Constitution gives them the power to do, then you can get into a constitutional crisis. For example, uh, the Supreme Court strikes down legislation that is critically important to the survival of our democracy. President Roosevelt believed in 1937 that he had to do what he's doing with the New Deal for us to not become like Stalin's Russia or Hitler's Germany. Um, and the court was standing in his way. That created a constitutional crisis. So the court backed down. Um, ultimately, at least one, one justice did. Uh, whenever you talk about trying to impeach a justice in the United States Supreme Court, I believe that creates a constitutional crisis. The last time the rhetoric was used was Chief Justice Earl Warren, who had some very unpopular decisions about school integration, and people were running around putting up signs on the highways down south about let's impeach Justice Warren. Um, if Congress had pursued that, that could have created a constitutional crisis. Uh, when the President of the United States ignores the Constitution, the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution, and nobody's doing anything about it, but now maybe Congress will do something about it, that could create a constitutional crisis. The President of the United States ignores the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and gives speeches talking about the press that I've never heard any candidate use such language in referring to the press as the enemy of the people, unless you want to go back and look at the 1932 speeches given the presidential election in Germany. I mean, it is really scary stuff. That can create a constitutional <clears throat> crisis if he also is now taking concrete action. We've seen, you know, reporters, you know, they are not given access. We have antitrust suits brought against the parent company of CNN. Uh, we have various threats to the license of NBC. This is where Congress needs to investigate. We need to find out what retal concrete retaliatory actions have been taken by this administration towards the news media. Because we cannot live in a democracy. We're not going to keep a democracy if the government is allowed to harass the news media. And yet, what are we hearing out of Washington? Oh, presidential harassment. I feel bad for him. He feels harassed. Uh, but the media, critically important issue, uh, uh, the freedom of the press. So um, we're going to see what happens in the next two, two years. But because we no longer have a unified government, we've got now the Democrats control of the House, there may be much, there's much more likely to be a confrontation. And, you know, I think what happened in 1973 was a constitutional crisis. It was worked out, but it was a crisis. You know, the impeachment of Clinton, well, whatever. I mean, I think that's been blown up in a lot of drama with some of these people want to act as if there's a constitutional crisis, too. There's a question back here. A uh, strategy question, Professor. Why would uh, Robert Mueller allow the president to have a take-home test in submitting <laughs> answers rather than oral testimony or by a subpoena? And two, does Robert Mueller already know the answers that the president will submit? or his lawyers will submit. I think Robert Miller already knows the answers to the questions. I don't think this president uh, would do a particularly good job of telling the truth in a take home test, in a pop quiz or any other <laughs> setting. He's not, I, I, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, I, he's the last person in the world I want to represent because he just keeps changing his story. You know, why did you fire James Comey? Well, James Comey messed up on the Hillary investigation. Oh, no, now we're going to go in front of Russian television or whatever and say it was because of Russian investigation. Give me a break. Um, so, you know, I think Robert Mueller is going to let the president present evidence the way he wants to present evidence because either way, I think Robert Mueller is ahead of this game and knows what's going on. Another question back here. Yeah, uh, Professor, there's... Uh some thinking out there by some people that uh, with all the crazy lawsuits and pressure that Trump is under, he may just leave. He might not, e you know, even before 
running for re-election. That's a, just a comment. And then the question is, um, what do you make of the New York Times digging into all of his past finances with he and his father? Do you think there's a possibility that in the future there could be massive clawback fines? Yeah. Um, well, let's say talk about the possibility of his his just leaving. Um, reminds me of that time that um, President Bush landed on the aircraft carrier to declare victory about the Iraq thing. You know, I, I think that President Trump ought to declare he's made America great. I mean, the unemployment is a record low. He deserves credit for all of that. Um, <laughs> we are once again respected in the world. <laughs> all the coal mines are open and. And everything, and, and he has made America great. So in two years, you know, it takes other presidents eight years to do something, so he's made America great. Go home to New York. Go to Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> turn it over to Mike Pence. You know, that's a Republican's dream come true. <laughs> because I think that Donald, he is going to be a serious drag on the Republican ticket. Somebody's going to challenge him for the Republican nomination. So he's going to have to fight through that. And if he survives that, he's going to be an enormous downdraft on the Republican ticket in 2020. And you know, we're going to hear from Mueller. We're going to hear from the House Judiciary Committee. So that would be Republicans' dream come true. I don't think it's going to happen because nobody's rational. And that's the big problem on that one. Um, as for the Trump family finances, um, yeah, there have been some issues with the Trump family and business ethics going back to when Fritz Trump, Grandpa Trump, Immigrated from Germany, didn't want to get out, he wanted to get out of the draft in Germany, and I don't I don't mind anyone who wants to dodge the draft in Germany, at least during the Kaiser or any later period. Um, but he came over and ran the flop houses, mm, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then uh, Fred Trump, uh, Papa Trump, he uh, uh, didn't like paying taxes, so he figured out about a dozen different ways to get the money on down to his kids, uh, so there wouldn't be an estate to tax either by the state of New York or by the feds. And one of those children is a federal judge. So, you know, this is not a good situation. Now, apparently, Donald Trump was helping his dad evade taxes. Um, you know, some of that, the statute of limitations may have passed. It depends on the statute of limitations under federal tax law and state tax law. It certainly can get investigated. Uh, and it will be investigated. Uh, the state of New York is certainly going to look at it. Should the New York Times have done it? Absolutely, yes. The real question is, why did the New York Times do it like five years ago? <laughs> uh, you know, they wrote some articles on the business ethics or lack thereof of the Trump family, but anybody who's lived in New York knows that there's some issues there. Now, I know not, not every New York business person has impeccable ethics. We've had a few problems on Wall Street. <coughs> but even by the New York standards, in the New York real estate community, we had Helmsley. They already had Leona go to jail. And we had the Trump family. And I lived in New York long enough to know that people were joking about which of the two of them were sleazier. Now, you know, saying people are sleazy have a sleazy reputation and proving it are two different things. But the New York press has been on to this for quite a while. And I think they should have been digging a lot earlier. And this gets me one of my other concerns. There's a lot of appeal to anything having to do with sex. And so if the number of articles written about Donald Trump and his sexual exploits have been matched by articles talking about his business practices and his lack of business ethics over the years, we might not be here. Might not be here. But then again, again the people of the state of New York didn't elect him. Question here. Uh, what are your thoughts about Mike Pence's role in the administration? Yeah, he's probably in on it. I mean, he certainly was brought in on it once he, uh, once he became the vice presidential nominee. So he probably knew about the Russian interference in the election before the election. Now, he may be looking the other way. But the, the key is, I think he's been in on the obstruction of justice part of it. And so it's not just the crime, it's the obstruction of justice. And so think back to Watergate. Nixon didn't order the Watergate break-in, but the obstruction of justice brought down that White House. This is a vice president who I think has been in on it but we've never had the questions asked. This is exactly what the House Judiciary Committee needs to be doing, is finding out what the Vice President's role was in this. Um, this has to do with the Secret Service. Um, oh, no, okay. Um, 
the um, media had said that in March of 2017, the taxpayer cost of the Secret Service for the Trump family, um, even when they went for their business interests, um, already surpassed the first four years of the Obama administration. And now the media had just mentioned about the, um, the cost of housing, for example, the Secret Service at Mar-a-Lago, Mar apparently taxpayers are paying yeah. all of that. Do you have any, um, anything to comment about the Secret Service and the cost to the taxpayers? Well, it's sky high. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, the, and Donald Trump's kids are going around the world cutting deals, you know, using the power of the presidency. So they have the Secret Service in tow that gives them a certain, uh, you might say, Arab authority. Uh, you know, there's some countries that are more than happy to pay emoluments, even though maybe may be unconstitutional over here. Um, and why, why not route it through the, uh, through the kids? Um, I, you know, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, now, you don't necessarily want to revoke Secret Service protection of the family of the president because there are threats out there, but there should be some effort made to limit those costs. And there's no effort being made by the Trump family to limit the costs. Uh, you know, they have to be jet-setting all over the world trying to cut business deals for their father, exacerbating his financial conflicts of interest with Secret Service in tow. Do we need to be down at Mar-a-Lago every other weekend or whatever with massive Secret Service? Uh, you know, there's no effort to save, to save money here. And you know, there was a time when the Republicans talked about, you know, actually trying to cut the budget and save money. I mean, you know, and, and not just cutting food stamps. I mean, is that the only way they want to cut money is cut out kids' meals? Well, how about cutting this? I mean, this is ridiculous. So I'm, I'm, it really looks shameful, the way they're running this budget. But that's just the beginning. Secret Service is just the beginning. You don't get me going on Scott Pruitt in his tactical pants. <laughs> At least we got rid of him. Question here. Um, when, if Whitaker squelches uh, Trump's, or excuse me, uh, Mueller's report, what are the, how can we get around that? How can we ever f find it out? Oh, I think that um, uh, Robert Mueller could be called in front of the House Judiciary Committee. And I think he would come willingly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not as if a copy of that report hasn't probably also been given to the New York Attorney General. I mean, you know, Whitaker, just look at that. You think that guy's going to mess with Bob Mueller? No. He's an intellectual lightweight. I mean, Mueller's an experienced prosecutor, and he knows what he's doing, and he's been preparing for this moment. He knows exactly how to cover himself. So I, I, I have a lot of faith in Bob Mueller. We'll hear from him. Here's a question. For the uh, Democrats to be most effective in the House beginning in January, what subjects in the top three or four would you suggest they take up and in what order, assuming you could uh, work on their efficiency in doing those things? Russia, and that means not just the House Judiciary Committee, but the House Oversight Committee and the House Intelligence Committee. No, I don't know, with Devin Nunes, I guess they re-elected him. Well, they can put him in the back office somewhere because he's going <laughs> to shut his mouth and we're going to have a real investigation of what's been going on with Russia. Because this is a threat to our national security. So we're going to start with a threat to our national security and look at Russia and also look at Saudi Arabia and what's been going on with the Saudis. Uh, and I know that President Trump admires what the, how the Saudis handle dissident reporters. Uh, but, you know, he wishes he could do that over here. But we need, to, we need to get into this is a threat to our national security. So that's a number one priority. Uh, uh, the Russian interference in the election, relationships with other dictators, uh, the dictatorial regimes, uh, the financial ties of the Trump organization with foreign powers, not just the Russians. So a lot of this is going to be outside the scope of the Mueller investigation. Number one priority. Number two priority, how this Justice Department has been working in attempts to, to obstruct justice, the firing of FBI Director James Comey. That needs to be investigated uh, by the House Oversight Committee and the Judiciary Committee. Uh, attempts to, to, to uh, suppress the Mueller investigation, to obstruct justice. That's what brought Richard Nixon down, was obstruction of justice. 
Uh, I think that's a number one priority. Um, and then, you know, I think some of the other things, like what's been going on at the border, you know, I think we have immigration committees, you know, they can look at that. And I strongly disagree with the way President Trump has handled uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the influx of immigrants at the border, people seeking asylum. Uh, but that, you know, there should be an immigration committee, somebody else should be handling that. Um, yeah, I don't think the Democrats should use this opportunity to start with investigations that are more likely to appeal to their political base as opposed to the big stuff that affects every single American. Our national security, number one, obstruction of justice. And I would be careful about investigations involving sex. <laughs> you know, or the abuse, all of that stuff. And I know that's, that's tempting, but ever since I watched the Anita Hill testimony and saw Teddy Kennedy up there, and I thought, this isn't going to end well for the Democrats. And then they nominated Bill Clinton. I said, this is not going to end well for the Democrats. <laughs> and the Senate, you know, those races were some of them disappointing. And I wish that the Democrats put forward an argument about Kavanaugh that took that, those allegations into account, but that emphasized more the threat to our democracy with respect to what's happening in the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, I think it's very important to, um, to focus on the threat to our democracy, not the issue that may appeal to this constituency or that constituency. This is a time for America to come together. Because if you don't come together, if it's trying to play this group against that group or get into social issues too much, what's going to happen is Trump's going to win that. He loves, Trump loves identity politics because he just figures what the Democrats are doing on one side of the coin. And he goes to that other side of the coin. And he tries to get people angry and stirred up. And I, I sense him doing that with the Senate races with after the Kavanaugh thing, going after you know, male, men, male voters and making people feel threatened. He's got to be very, very careful because he will play that game. He's a master manipulator. We have a question over here. I heard a rumor that Donald Trump Donald Trump Jr. was going to be arraigned any day. Um, I don't know if you've heard that, but if in fact that is true, um, on what grounds do you project? Yeah, well, I wouldn't have any information coming from Bob Mueller because that office does not leak. Yeah, there are no leaks coming out of Mueller's office. Um, why would Donald Trump Jr. have some exposure? He was in on that Trump Tower meeting. And um, that was a meeting with a Russian agent. That was collaboration. Come on, the Russian agent is coming, they're promising the dirt on Hillary, and what do they want? They want the sanctions re uh, released. We know what the deal is. And they say it's about Russian baby adoption? So come on, give me a break. Uh, so there was collaboration, there was whatever. Now whether that was illegal or not, what happened in that meeting, I don't know. So there could be some legal exposure if there's a violation of the campaign finance laws because the Russians were giving assistance to the campaign by way of opposition research on Hillary Clinton. No, you don't outsource your opposition research to foreign governments. That's a no-no. So there could be some exposure there. The other area of exposure is obstruction of justice because as soon as that Trump Tower meeting was disclosed to the public and people started asking about it, Donald Trump, the president, and his son, and they're talking about what should the son say to the press. Now, it's not illegal to lie to the press. If it were, they'd all be in jail. <laughs> uh, but if you're making up a story you're gonna give to the press because you're gonna then tell the same story to Bob, Robert Mueller, well, then you are conspiring to lie to the prosecutors. False statement statute, 18 United States Code 1001. It's the do not lie to the Fed statute. And if the feds of Robert Mueller, definitely don't lie to the feds. So he could have some problems there. So yeah, he's got some exposure. Now those are federal charges. The president, I guess, could try to pardon his son. We'd see how that worked out. But uh, it would not end very well for the Trump family. And I haven't even got to Jared and Ivanka. <laughs> I got a question for you. Uh, this is very fine what you've said. It's sort of like Vern Gagne and the WWF. What bothers me is China. 
We think in terms of two years and four years. They think in terms of a hundred years. They've got the Silk Road coming up through Africa. They've got the Silk Road coming up the old way to the British English Channel. China will never go start a war against us for one simple reason. They're winning. Yeah. Big time. And they're going to get so far ahead, we're going to get in trouble. And this is what bothers me about what's going on with our government. They're so involved picking at each other that China is just pulling away and getting the whole deal. They're in South America now. And so what happens to me, I want to think in a hundred years, not mm -hmm. two or four years. And what's happened to American voters is they're going to have to catch on to this, hopefully, and they're going to have to see what's going to be there for our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren, uh, pollution and all these things. China must be sitting there and just laughing their belly off about how we're, we're taking ourselves out. Mm -hmm. We're spending too much time in the penalty box. I got five skaters, they only got four. It's a problem, big time. I think that when they also, all this settles down Russia, there's only so much power they can have. You know, they've been playing this game for over a century, Russia, trying to manipulate Western democracies, uh, going back to the communist era, even under the czars. But the Russians have always felt they had a losing hand vis-a-vis -vis the West. Even under Peter the Great, they felt inferior as if they had a losing hand. Uh, they found out they had a losing hand in the Cold War. Now, you can argue, gee, did they win the Cold War by capturing the White House in 2016? Well, whatever. <laughs> but Vladimir Putin, long term, he's going to be a pain in the rear, yes. But Russia is still a declining world superpower because they don't have the economy to match the, uh, uh, the military might. And given the changes in technology and military technology, uh, yes, no one's going to attack Russia because, yes, they can destroy human civilization. Uh, but they aren't going to be able to be number one. China's a different story because China is a very robust economy with a very high growth rate uh, and will be the largest economy in the world very soon. Now, they have three times as many people as we do, so their per capita income is not as high. The Chinese have pursued a very different strategy than the Russians. The Chinese uh, have not gotten involved militarily in a lot of different places, and indeed a very different strategy than the United States, because they watched Russia, the United States, and Great Britain under the British Empire get overextended, spend enormous amounts of money in military engagements, and, you know, it doesn't work out, whether it's the Russians in Afghanistan, the British in Afghanistan, or the Americans in Afghanistan, or the Americans in Vietnam, it goes on and on. The Chinese pursue a different strategy. People around the world love money, so they invest. They invest in South America, they invest in Africa. They use some coercion with their investment. They buy off some government officials. Absolutely, yes. If there is a country that Donald Trump refers to as an S-hole country, the Chinese are there, <laughs> fast. So they are going to go after the natural resources in Africa and Latin America and Asia all over the place. Well, our president is spouting racist rhetoric. I mean, we are destroying our country and our preeminence in the world. One, we had to over, overextend ourselves militarily, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, we went through that phase. And now we're going through the phase of well, America first, America first. You don't look like us, us, F you. Well, the Chinese aren't doing it that way. And so this is a serious problem. Are we going to come out of this clearly the number two power in the world when it comes to influence in Africa, influence in Asia, influence in Latin America? Uh, you know, the, are the Chinese going to be well ahead of us because they use the diplomacy of money and investment Cool it on the racist rhetoric. The Japanese always have the problem with the racial superiority thing. The Chinese don't play that game. They want to do deals. They want to do deals that help them. They're in it for themselves. But, you know, I, I, I think it's a very, very bad situation. But Donald Trump, if any president who's weakened us versus China, has been President Trump. And he's done very little to fix the trade deficit. 
in return, you know, what we're getting is a, a situation where all over the world, the Chinese are the financiers, and they're the investors, they're the partners, and they're going to own more and more of the politicians around the world. Yes, and in my book on campaign finance, by the way, I wrote about this before Donald Trump ever took office, that we don't fix Citizens United. China's actually the country to, to worry about because guess where all the big corporations are? They're the United States, China, European Union, some Japan. But China's big, and their acquisitions in the United States are big, and their joint ventures with American companies are big. We have a question here. I am listening and agreeing with everything I hear you saying, and yet I'm wondering how what you're saying would go over in the red states in the southern half of this country. What is it that prevents a message such as yours from being accepted and applauded <clears throat> the way it is here? And what would it take for that kind of a message to be heard and moved upon in the South? Yeah. Um, well, the history of the South, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we've, the South has had the balance of power. For years, they did the Democratic Party at the Solid South. And when I was born, the Solid, Solid South was Democratic. Nixon then started to bring them into the Republican Party, and now they're in with the Republican Party. And there's, there's power that comes with that ability to control one of the two political parties, or at least be able to dictate some terms to one of the two political parties. Uh, we've always had this north-south rivalry, uh, you know, in the, the aftermath of the Civil War. And we have some social issues that engage the South in a different way than they do the North. Um, that's why I think it's critically important to separate out our concerns. We can disagree about social issues such as abortion. You know, but when our country is under threat from a foreign power, are we going to allow our disagreements about abortion to take front and center stage? And I had to fight with liberal Democrats about this and say, even though I think the Supreme Court had the right decision on the Roe versus Wade thing, this emphasis on abortion is if this is the big deal. When our country is under attack, all it does is stir people up who are on the other side. Instead of recognizing that that's an issue, that there are, there are arguments on both sides, and I think we ought to talk to each other. And instead of making that the holy grail, uh, you know, are we a country that is going to make the abortion, I don't care what side of that issue you're on, the holy grail of American politics and so important that you would allow your politician to be sold out to the Russians who have been trying to undermine Western democracies at least since the 1917 Russian Revolution. And, you know, so part of the way to re-engage the South is to try and you disagree about some of these social issues, but not run them way up the flagpole, is this is the big deal. And, you know, we don't like you, and making it a culture war. And that's why, hey, culture war, identity politics, all that, it is about we are together as a country. And, uh, you know, I know we fought that civil war, and they didn't want to be part of it, but it's been a while. And the South is rising economically, and has benefited a lot from being part of this union. Do they want it turned over to the Russians? So what's in your economic interest? What's in your patriotic interest? We are all Americans. Here's a question. Okay, I, this is somewhat of a follow-up here to that gentleman's question or need an opinion. We've always had spin on facts. Nowadays, we also have alternative facts and we have outright lies. And we have, you know, a, a fairly fairly large percentage of the population, close to a third, who actually believe that, you know, the Russian investigation is a witch hunt, and they believe everything that Donald Trump says, even to a greater extent than they do their families. Yeah, they believe Robert Mueller is a liberal Democrat. <laughs> you ever met Robert Mueller? <laughs> liberal Democrat, what? Um, he was a high school classmate of John Kerry, they played hockey together. I don't even call John Kerry a liberal, but anyway, uh, it was what he is. Uh, you know, the idea of the alternative facts that we are not going to believe when the Russians clearly interfered in this election is so obvious. They hacked. Who do we think hacked the emails? Oh, it's a 300 pound man or whatever Donald Trump was referring to. Uh, are we still going to believe that's a fairy tale? We know what the Russians want. 
The Russians want to control what happens in the United States. Now, they aren't going to favor Republicans over Democrats or vice versa for ideological reasons any more than people used to make up stories that the Russians wanted to elect Democrats because, oh, oh Democrats were commies. I mean, no. They want to undermine our democracy. They want to sow havoc in this country. So they put Trump in there, but they, and I just wrote an op-ed on this um, uh, with a psychologist out in California, Leon White, and we looked at what's going on, the behavior of the Republican members of Congress. There's significant evidence that Russians have stuff on them. They've hacked the RNC emails. The Russians are aware of a lot of the scandals in the United States. <laughs> and what happens in Congress. They know where Congress people and members of Congress of both parties have been getting their money from. They know about the sex scandals. And now with the Me Too thing going on, you know, and allegations can take down a congressman. Allegations are 15, 20 years old. The Russians are gonna gather that information as well. And they've got the goods on members of Congress, including some of these Republicans. Now, I don't know what goods they have on, for example, Lindsey Graham, but boy, Lindsey Graham do a 180 <laughs> after he was on the golf course with Donald Trump. So, you know, this is very real, what's going on. And it fits into the pattern of the way the Russians have been dealing with the West for a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we want to use alternative facts and make up stories because of what we want to believe, we do so at the risk of our democracy. I and think, we are under threat. I think we have time for just one more question, and I'm going to hand the mic to this gentleman. Thank you, Dr. Peener for presenting a very nice, oh, it's a little biased, I would say. Uh, in, no, we're all biased. But, but I, I'm an advocate of MSNBC. But I would say that uh, if we were to take and, and uh, venture around this particular crowd, that we're all guilty of the China problem. I have a hat here that I look at. It's Dockers. But what does it say in there? made in China. Now, if China doesn't have a market, they aren't going to stay in business, and we are them. I, I have one other question. Uh, what's your take on Clarence Thomas for the next 15 years? <laughs> well, it's uh, all the rest of uh, the court. I mean, this court, uh, you know, campaign finance and some other key issues, uh, I think, has been very activist. Uh, there's been attempts to politicize this court. Um, but I think, in my view, the same problems with Clarence Thomas we have, whether it's Justice Alito, I think Chief Justice Roberts is trying to move to the center. But I would focus on uh, uh, you know, the, the, the role of the Supreme Court of democracy. And is, is this court becoming excessively political? And I wouldn't pin it all on Thomas. And regardless, like, no, I would not reopen the sexual stuff. I mean, that is just not the harassment thing. I, I just think, you know, the Democrats don't focus, and they go for the low-hanging fruit, and the stuff that has never worked for the Democrats in the past, they're going to get burnt. And these Senate races didn't work out so well, because I don't think the Kavanaugh hearing focused on the really big issue, which was, uh, you know, the politicization of the court. The sexual abuse thing was a terrible, particularly with Keith Ellison on the ticket. I think Keith Ellison... The reason he was elected was Minnesotans don't want to politicize AG's office. That's really important to us because we see what's happening to the Attorney General's office in Washington, D.C. We don't want it in Minnesota. And that's how he won that election against Doug Wardlow because Wardlow was talking about firing Democrats. And even though the sexual abuse stuff gets way up there, and it's an issue, yes, but this politicization of the courts, the Supreme Court, politicization of the Justice Department, Whitaker, and then what could have had Minnesota Warlow been elected, that resonates with a lot of voters. And ultimately, it's going to be about our democracy. And this shouldn't be a Democrat versus Republican thing. And I'll tell you, I've gone after Democrats. I've made it clear to the chair of the state party here that <laughs> he's got some issues to deal with. So I've gone after Democrats. But this is about America. We're all together. We've got to be together. I think we'll have to end on that note. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>